correctly, meaning that you're at the gym on Tuesday or you're driving on your commute on Friday or something like that, really equally glad to have you. Here's what I'd like to say to you folks that are asynchronous in the midweek oasis. You that are watching it, picking it up later, uh, checking in on Saturdays or any other days. If, if that's you, don't think that you don't have the opportunity to ask questions. You do. You just simply need to text me or you simply need to email me and say, Steve, I'm curious about this particular thing and I want to know how I can do better with it or I want to know how uh, what we know what the, what the Lord might have to say about this or that related to the topic. And then I'll be able to dialogue with you on email and we'll be able to work through it together. We're, you're welcome to meet with me, contact uh, the office and make up an appointment. I'd be happy to meet with you. That's what I signed up to do 37 years ago, I think it is now, uh, involved in ministry. That was the calling of God on my life to just be available for people to be able to understand and learn more about the, the way of Jesus. That's my goal. So if you're interested in that, I'm always available, happy to meet with you and talk about these particular things or anything else that I treat in a sermon or a teaching. Now, I want to drop back a little bit to Sunday and talk or review just a moment last weekend's compassion experience. I was talking to some folks that are here in person, and the idea of last weekend was to stimulate thinking, to stimulate a sense of awareness. And that was the goal of my teaching. The preaching was the goal of the te testimony from Sandeep. It was the goal of uh, the, the testimonies from the folks from our church who sponsor children through the multimedia compassion journey. This, this is why we did it, to raise awareness. I'm, I'm concerned about funding. I'm concerned about sponsoring children. But I want you to know more than anything, I'm concerned about you developing a biblical lifestyle and posture of uh, towards the poor. Towards the poor. Multiple times in Scripture, Jesus is calling his people to, to care about, to wonder about, to respond to the needs of the poor. In fact, that's what Jesus did in all his preaching and teaching. He went around to the people that were in need, and he ministered to those people in need. And then he said to us, I want you to do more than I do. I want you to continue this work. I want you to care for the poor. I want you to touch and intervene in the needy's lives. This, this is Jesus living a life and then calling us to live the same kind of life. So I'm hoping that this that last weekend it, it inspired you. It caused you to become more aware. Perhaps the Holy Spirit convicted you to respond, to get to engage in the process, to do something about it, whatever that might be, whether it's praying or sponsoring a child or, you know, just being more aware. Uh, so I'm asking you to, in, to think about what the Lord would have you do in response to last weekend. Uh, that YouTube is up, the service and the sermon is up, the testimonies are there. All the opportunity for you to engage is there. On our church app, there are videos. You click the compassion button. You can go to the various videos that are there. You can scroll the opportunity to sponsor children. Uh, all of it is there. In fact, on our app is last weekend's sermon and testimonies. And all of those things that are for your awareness to raise the level of Christ-likeness in you regarding the poor. So com compassion sponsorship is still available. You can go on the app, scroll the kids. They are all from the area in Nicaragua where we sponsor children and where we dig wells. So if you ever go on a well digging trip, you will be able to visit your sponsored child as long as we're beyond COVID. And so right now, they're not doing trips or making visits. 
but they expect to begin in the spring again. And we are ramping up to a summer of mission trip experiences. So if you would be interested in going in the summer to visit your child, to drill a well, we're going to attempt to send one, two, three teams down this coming summer. The cost is between $17.50 and $18.50 for seven or eight days, all inclusive. So typically it's a seven day trip, depending on the difficulty of the well or the travel that we would need to do regarding uh, where to go to do that well or to see your sponsored child. So that's how the days uh, work. And so if you're interested, start saving, start putting some money away, and it, you will never go on any trip that's more transformative than being able to drop in to a country like Nicaragua and visit a child who was just on the refrigerator. And then all of a sudden it's in 3D. It is an amazing experience. So I certainly hope you'll be open to that. Compassion Sponsorship still available. You can go to our app and get all the information. This coming Sunday, very important worship night for us. We are in a subdivision process in, in our back property, and that has stalled. We're spinning wheels, and we are asking God to break, help us break free, to get traction and to move this thing forward. What we need is goodwill from the county council and the county executive. That's what we need. And so we are asking you to show up Sunday night for a special session of spiritual warfare. I'm not talking about we're against the county council or against the county executive. We just want God to do whatever God needs to do to open up the door to move us forward in the process. That will lead to us being as a church completely debt free. That is amazing. We're talking about retiring millions of dollars of debt servicing, freeing up $20,000 a month for us to turn into doing ministry. And if you remember the Freedom Seed campaign, we talked about dream after dream after dream after dream. If we just had the liquidity of money to be able to engage those things. That back property has been available for us for, you know, 30 years. And it's, it's, it's a gold mine, so to speak, of opportunity to, to vanquish debt. And so I certainly hope that you will help us to pray this coming Sunday night at our worship night. We're also going to be celebrating the Rudy uh, celebration, uh, graduation. We're going to also uh, celebrate baptisms. There's three or so baptisms that are going to be available, and we're going to take care of that evening. It's going to be a beautiful worship night Sunday, 6 p.m. in the sanctuary. And today is November 17th, 1980. Actually, it's 2021. Angelo, would you subtract 1980 from 2021 and tell me how many years that is? Because November 17th, 1980 is when I gave my heart to the Lord. I am 41 years old in spiritual years. <laughs> 41 years old in spiritual years. So uh, it's a great day for me. I had the opportunity to be with several of the people that uh, were instrumental in leading me to Christ. In fact, I was quite struck with the reality that I was actually standing in a kitchen uh, doing a friend's Thanksgiving this past weekend and talking to the, the guy who was in the back seat of the 1960 Dodge Dart that we were in, that we both gave our hearts to the Lord in the same day, the same time. It was a beautiful experience to see him and me together. And then there were the leaders of the Youth for Christ clubs that were there. Uh, we were all celebrating the goodness of God in our lives and the joy that it meant to be in fellowship for, for Lord. I think it was... I think it was 37 years we've been getting together uh, since high school and celebrating the Lord's goodness in our life. 
Uh, many of them are working for the Lord in various ministries and serving in churches. It's a beautiful thing. So, uh, yes, thank you, because I know that you're saying, happy birthday, Pastor Steve. Happy spiritual birthday. Thank you. Thank you for that. Also, next week is Thanksgiving, so uh, we are not going to be in session next week. Next week, no midweek oasis. If you tune in, it just simply means that you tuned out while I was making this announcement. So if you get on next week online, if you tune in next week, not my problem. You, you were tuned out when I was making this announcement. All right, let's talk about, let's get into our subject tonight. I want to, uh, Angela, is our slides up now? Okay, very good. Uh, this is the last part of our biblical sex series. So we need to get all of our questions in tonight. We need to get them in, get them dealt with. We need to ask those critical questions, whatever they might be. Uh, I know you might be tired of this topic, especially for you that were with me on Sunday morning during the series. You that have been with me on Wednesday night as we've rehearsed the series. But this is such a critical topic in our current culture. I want you to ask yourself this question. Ask yourself this question. Could you fully explain a biblical theology of sex to someone who is anti-Bible, anti-Christian faith. And they would say Christians are prudish, Christians are antiquated, they're archaic, they're out of date, they're irrelevant. Christians in the Bible's view on sex is Neanderthal, so to speak. It's old school. Well, I've been teaching you and teaching you and teaching you how to respond to that. And so my question for you is, if you were to run into someone who is anti-Christian faith in that negative way I just described, or someone who is pro-abortion, or someone who is pro-LGBTQ+, or someone who is pro-transgender, can you clearly distinguish a biblical theology of sex. Can you clearly distinguish between consumer and covenantal sex? If you had to make a case for that, could you get a piece of paper and sketch it out on a piece of paper referencing the scriptures? Do you know the key biblical passages to substantiate a biblical theology of sex? If not, then you may want to just stay with me here and not feel so tired about this subject. We, we seem to have less people tuning in tonight than we've had before when we're doing other topics. And so maybe folks are tired. My question is always asking you, can you defend a biblical theology of sex. If not, then you haven't spent enough time with this subject. So when I served as the clinical director of the Heritage Professional Counseling Center before I became the lead pastor, all of my marriage cases presented with the problem of money or sexuality. All of them presented with some kind of money or sexual problem that was going on within the context of the relationship. And so I really do believe that it's critical that we understand that God is indeed expecting us to know what to do with this sense of sexuality. Let's take a look at Matthew 5, 27. Matthew 5, 27. You have heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So if your eye, even your good eye, causes you to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. If your hand, even your strong hand, 
causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is talking to people about many different areas of life. He talks about money. He talks about poverty. Uh, he talks about marriage. He talks about uh, heaven and hell. He talks about righteousness. All of these things he talks about in the area of the Sermon on the Mount. Love and sex are one of those areas of life that Jesus talks about. Now, if Jesus is going to take real estate within his Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon of all time, and he's going to spend time talking about sex and sexuality, it's probably wise of us to, to kind of set up, sit up and take notice of the Lord speaking to us about this topic. It must be important. So this is one of those passages that I was saying a little bit earlier, folks point to when they want to characterize Christianity as prudish or culturally oppressive or regressive in some sense. So folks will point to this passage and they'll misinterpret it, they'll mischaracterize it, and they will use it against you. And as we've talked about recently, the Bible is often misinterpreted through faulty cultural filters. And when that happens, if you don't have a solid understanding of a biblical theology of sex, you will simply just buckle in your witness. And that's unfortunate because Christ expects you and me to be able to respond to people who are coming against Christianity in an, in an unfriendly way and misrepresenting and characterizing Christianity. And when we don't have a solid foundation, because we're often interested in, well, I'm bored with this subject. Let's move on. What's something new? I just want to do something new. Come on, keep it going, keep it going. And then you can't even really truly dialogue intelligently about a biblical theology of sex. You're actually, I, my job is to equip you. Your job is to get out there and be a witness for Christ. Your job is to testify to the things that I've equipped you with. But if you're not even interested in being equipped, how is it possible that you could be tired of this subject? Or want to move on or jump, let's get on with it. I'm tired of this. I'm bored with that. But you can't even represent Christ well. I mean, to be fair, when non Christian folks read this passage at face value, it seems and probably perhaps seems to you that it would be easy to get the impression that Jesus is saying, if you have sexual desire, you're going to hell. If you have any sexual desire, you're going to hell. Procreation is okay, but don't enjoy it. You know, that's what a lot of people think that aren't Christians and they're characterizing, misinterpreting this passage. And that feeds, that feeds into the prudish, out-of-touch opinion of Christianity that many people have. And many of us grew up with this religiously negative view of sex. It was dirty. It's secretive. It's a far more bad thing than good thing. So we have to avoid it at all costs and don't talk about it and don't dress it and don't celebrate it in any way because we don't want to be inappropriate. But nothing could be more appropriate than Christians celebrating sex in the way that God originally intended it to be. This is a tragedy when Christians are stuck in that Victorian puritanical disposition that characterizes sex as dirty off there in the shadows and doesn't ever need to be talked about. The real deal is that biblical sexuality and sensuality is one of the most attractive things about Christianity. Our children should know this. We should celebrate this and be quite comfortable with this and joyful about this. Christian parents are the witnesses to their children of the joy that God intends sex and sexuality and sensuality to be. So, so today we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the integrity of sex, the challenge of lust, the future of love. Now, first, the integrity of sex. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus clearly supports 
the notion that adultery is bad. He didn't say sex was bad. He said adultery is bad. That's a given. But he's got a whole lot more in mind here. This is what the Christ of Christianity has in mind about sex. One word, covenant. Covenant. No sex outside of a covenant. That's the deal. But the word covenant, unfortunately, is such an unusual word to us. We just don't use it often. It seems to only be used in home settlement documents. I remember being at our settlement to the house we live in now, and they handed us a big folder, a big file of covenants. What are covenants? You know, <laughs> I mean, law I get, contract I get, covenants. Well, that's a little bit outdated. Nobody uses the word covenant in normal life. So can I give you another word? Another word for covenant that would make more sense. No. No, I don't have another word. I don't know of another word that makes more sense than covenant. And Christians need to redeem the sense of covenant. Because the word covenant is more than a way of thinking. It's a way of being. And when we get that through our heads, that it's not some construct to be able to intellectualize about, it's actually a way of being in relationship to those that matter to us, to people in general. We are in covenant with those folks whom we are in loving relationship with as family or friends, particularly our spouse. So let me explain by contrasting a covenant relationship with a consumer relationship. Now, if you've been through our covenant course, you know this, but my bet is that if I were to quiz you on it, uh, you, you wouldn't get it. I, you wouldn't pass if I was to quiz you on it. So let's look at these. Consumer trait. Supply and demand relationship. Well, if I was to be quizzing you, you'd have to fill in the blank on covenanter trait. I'm not sure everyone watching or say again. You think that's the wording? Uh oh. <laughs> that's a general sentiment, Angelo. But if we were quizzing, you wouldn't have gotten that one right. I'm sorry. Okay. Points off, Angelo. That's right. So a consumer trait, supply and demand, covenant or trait, serve and depend. Burger King mentality, I want it my way. King of Kings mentality, I want it his way. Not your husband's way, God's way. <laughs> That's what you want. I was talking with a couple the other day as they were going through some marriage mentoring. It was so beautiful. Uh, the, you know, the guy that was sitting there, you know, the, the groom to be. He was saying, you know, all my life I've lived in consumer relationships. This is the relationship I want to be transformed into a servant. I want to serve. I want to lay down my life for my spouse. And, and I recalled to them, do you recall the service where we laid our crowns at the foot of the cross? We all got Burger King crowns. And I invited you during spiritual response to bring it up and lay it down. I said, perhaps what we need to do is have Burger King crowns at your wedding and you can put them on and then you can take them off and lay them at the foot of Jesus. <laughs> you know, maybe for that. Yes. What's in it for me? A consumer. What's in it for me? A covenanter. What's in me for them? A consumer. Self-oriented. Covenanter. Others oriented. Consumer. Here to be served. Covenanter, here to serve. A uh, consumer, a vow to leave if my preferences or demands aren't met. Uh, either of you uh, in here ever leave a restaurant or a place where your needs were not being met? You just, you just disconnected and left. And both in here, myself included. Uh, I am not going to go somewhere and pay good money and not be served well. I'm a consumer. I want it my way. But in the context of Christian faith, in the context of the Christian church community, in the context of a covenantal marriage relationship, it's not a vow to leave if my preferences or demands aren't met. It is a vow to stay in spite of my preferences or demands not being met. 
Now, I got to tell you, this is entirely countercultural. Uh, there's so many people, when I talk about that, they just kind of give me that doggy head tilt, like, what? That's something I've never seen before. That doesn't seem to make sense. That, that's because we have developed, listen carefully, we have developed over our lifetime neural pathways of consumerism. We'll be talking about this a little bit more on Sunday, not in the context of sexuality, but in the context of what it means to come with thanksgiving before the Lord. Neural pathways are regular ways of thinking. And you might say, well, that's just because it's true. That's just because it's good and it's normal. No, no, I'm sorry. A consumer mentality in the context of a Christian marriage relationship is not normal. It is not. It is intended to be converted. In the West, in our American culture and European culture, we have been conditioned. Our neural pathways of consumerism have been plowed. And we expect that the customer is always right. We expect that as consumers, we get to demand our needs be met. We expect that. That's because we have been grooved. The culture has cut a groove in our way of thinking, and we think as consumers primarily. To be transformed and to think as a covenanter takes hard work to plow a brand new neural pathway. Neuroscientists actually talk about this, how to reroute, rewire, replow a new neural pathway. That's what God is asking you to do. And you might say, well, why, how do you say that, Steve? Neuroscience is not in the Bible. Really? Romans 12, 2. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. God knows what he's doing. God made you and he's aware of how to transform your brokenness from consumerism to covenantal living. Marriage in the Bible was not a contract between supplier and customer. It was intended to be a covenant between Savior and servant. Savior, Jesus, redeeming both husband and wife and them equally committing to serving Christ and each other. That is the beauty of a covenant relationship, which is antithetical to a consumer relationship. How beautiful is the marriage where each spouse is just falling all over themselves, attempting to bless and serve the other. Oh man, that is a joyful, joyous relationship where, where, the, where which each spouse feels almost embarrassed at how much the other spouse serves them and honors them and blesses them. And then that spouse just can't heap enough blessing and service on the other person. Oh my goodness, what a glorious testimony to the joy of serving Christ in the way that God always intended it to be. Now, be clear, just because you date and or marry a Christian does not mean that you have a covenant partner. So if you are realizing... <laughs> Whether, whether you're looking into the screen and you're saying, well, Lord have mercy. You know, I certainly was in relationships in my past where they were that way. Maybe you've been divorced. Maybe you've had bad breakups. And you realize now looking back, it was probably a, coven a covenanter consumer conflict. So if you realize today that right now your boyfriend or girlfriend or your spouse 
is a consumer. If it's you who's the consumer, repent. If the consumer is your date, run. If your spouse is a consumer, pray. And get some good godly wisdom and counsel on how to find a way to live as a covenanter in a consumer context without allowing yourself to be abused. Because if any covenanter is in a relationship with a consumer, it's very, very likely that there will be abuse. The consumer will consume the covenanter. The covenanter will always feel like they're supposed to be giving, 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 and the consumer will do what a consumer does, consume all the giving. And that means that you as the covenanter need to find counsel to posture yourself in a way that continues to maintain a covenantal disposition, yet guards against being abused in the relationship. Because when you're in a biblical covenantal relationship, oh my goodness, how different than what a consumer relationship offers. Now, realize that I can be talking about friendships as well. Friendships are characterized by covenantal friendships or consumer friendships. Uh, even in a, a relationship where one friend is a covenanter and one friend is a consumer, that will breed abuse as well. And so we need to recognize that. If you've noticed that, you're waking up and going, wow, quarters are dropping. I'm like, oh, yeah, that person just sucked me dry and never seemed to give back. And hello, covenanter consumer, covenanter consumer. That's just the way that that is. The consumer covenantal conflict is real across all relationships. Now, listen carefully. This is something that you're going to have to train your child in. Every child is born consumer. Every child is born a consumer. What child comes out of the womb and says, hey, mom, no, 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 really, how can I feed you? <laughs> uh, no, 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 mom, how can I help you? And nobody's saying that. You know, so we, over time, need to consistently, over time, somehow, some way, drive the consumerism out of our children. And we do that by modeling covenant and correcting consumerism over time in hopes that that child will have a good vision when they move into adulthood of what a, co a covenanter looks like so that they will look for a covenanter in Christ to be in relationship with. That would be a great goal. Let's talk about this. In, uh, in a relationship between two covenanters that is biblically based, you get at least two things. One is a zone of security and safety in the relationship where you can truly be yourself. Two are deep feelings beyond transactional feelings you get transformational feelings and these are very different and very much high quality rather than low quality regarding feelings one in a consumer relationship you're always marketing always marketing you're always selling yourself you're always trying to win the approval of the consumer you're always looking for consumer satisfaction ratings. You have to perform. You have to meet the other person's needs because they're vowing to leave if you don't. Maybe said or unsaid, conscious or unconscious, you know no matter what vows they set on that chancel, for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, you know that if you fall short of meeting their needs performance-wise, they're likely to be out if it gets too bad, if it gets too difficult. Or at least they'll be perpetually disgruntled with you and punish you <laughs> for a long time. They will punish you because you are not measuring up to the consumer satisfaction rating that they're expecting. So in biblical marriage, in, in a covenantal biblical marriage, 
you can finally feel safe when both people are genuine covenanters. You can finally feel safe. You can get rid of the mask of marketing. You can reveal your insecurities, your fears, your dreams. You can stop marketing. You can simply be honest. I'm not talking about ugly or brutal or unkind. I'm talking about being real. In a covenantal relationship, being able to be real is one of the great joys. You can be yourself. One is a zone of security and safety in the relationship where you can truly be yourself. Two, in a covenant relationship, when you're committed to a person in spite of your feelings, deeper feelings grow. These covenant feelings are much, much deeper than transactional feelings. Transactional feelings are a little thrill. You know, you said you had a need, they satisfied your need, you had a bit of a transaction, and now you feel pretty good for a moment until you have another need and you're demanding another supply. But in this sense, in a covenant relationship, deeper feelings, higher quality feelings, they're not transactional, they're transformational. Meaning, I love you whether you meet my needs or not. You cannot make me not love you. Oh my goodness, that is freedom. Here's nothing you can do. You can't make me not love you. I love you. Period. End of story. That is transformational. In that context, when both covenanters are offering that kind of love, that kind of feeling, oh my goodness, what rises is, is a sense of great joy. That's transformational love. Now, again, this can only be achieved when both people are in covenant. You see, if you're in a consumer relationship that is based on transactional feelings, where if you're not meeting my needs, I don't feel the love. I ain't feeling it, baby. If you don't make me happy, I'm not going to be happy. And you're going to pay for it. I'll make your life miserable because I'm not getting what I want. Even if you think of yourself as a Christian and a covenanter and you act this way, you need to wake up and realize you actually are a consumer parading around as a covenanter. You are a, you are a consumer in covenanter sheepskin. That's what you are. So if you are in a relationship where you are acting this way, where you're pouting and punishing because you don't get your needs met. They're not doing what you want for want them to do. And you think you're a covenanter? Well, just get real. Time to get real. Time to repent. You're not. You need to become the real, authentic thing. If you're in a relationship like that, you're a slave. You're not free. A slave of what? A slave of your feelings. Based on consumer feelings. If you're in a relationship where you're, you're the consumer and you're always sensitive, you're always offended, you're always not getting your needs met, you're always needing to punish somebody, you're always acting hurt, you're always acting like people are not meeting your needs and all that, you are in a consumer relationship. And when that happens, it's like all I can think about is, is that Righteous Brothers song. I mean, you guys, we've lost that love and feeling. <laughs> Whoa, that loving feeling. We've lost that loving feeling. Now it's gone, gone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? What kind of crazy, kooky living is that? That's slavery. That's not freedom. That's consumerism. That's, that's bondage. That's not covenantal joy. You're, you're not free in a consumer relationship based on the thrill of feelings. B.B. King will start selling, singing, the thrill is gone. He'll just start rolling on that blues song. And you'll be thinking all the time, the thrill is gone. I don't have the thrill. She, you know, she or he, they're not thrilling me anymore. That's a relationship of slavery, not freedom. Come on. Christians, come on. Wake up. Get real. Look in the mirror of Scripture. Repent. Seek Christ. That you would be willing to lay down your life for your covenantal spouse. 
If you want to live a life freely, biblically, make a promise. Say, I'm not here for you to adjust to me. I'm here to adjust to you. And some of you right now are saying, no, no way. I would never say that because then that will give them an inch and they'll take a mile. And that just simply means you're married, married to, or you're in a relationship with a consumer. I don't care if they call themselves a covenant or not. If you're afraid of that, then you're obviously in a relationship with a consumer. Somebody needs to repent. A covenant says you're more important than my feelings and my needs. This is plain in Ephesians 5 and 1 Corinthians 7. I'll take this one step further. When a man and a woman in marriage cultivate a romantic covenant relationship over a consumer relationship, it makes all the difference in the world regarding sex. How could that be? Let me explain. A covenant relationship makes all the difference in the world regarding sex because the Bible says that sex is a covenant good, not a consumer good. Sex as a consumer good is a powerful commodity to manipulate others to give us what we want. When sex is imagined to be a consumer good, customer satisfaction is the end goal. I'm not talking about sexual satisfaction. I'm talking about relational satisfaction. If you don't meet my needs, if you don't satisfy what I'm wanting out of this relationship, whatever it is, whether that you're organized or you're just punctual or you do the dishes or you pay the bills or whatever you do, if, if that's the kind of mentality you've got, people in that as a consumer in that relationship will use sex as a manipulative tool in order to force you into doing what they want you to do. Nothing could be more abusive, even within Christian marriage, for sex to be withheld or or over aggressive or whatever it might be in order to be able to try to get what I want done. We all have to look into the mirror of scripture. We all have to take inventory in front of the Holy Spirit to say, is there any wrong way in me? Search me and know me. If there is, show me and I will repent and make it right. Sex is the central commodity exchanged in a consumer relationship. You may have imagined that you're in a covenantal relationship because you assume you're a covenanter because you're a Christian. But you use sex as a manipulative tool. Often, even in Christian marriage, because we brought consumerism of the culture right into what's supposed to be covenantal culture, we corrupt biblical sex and turn it into or, or operate in a worldly sex-oriented idea. The Bible says sex was not designed to be a consumer good. It was designed to be a covenantal good. And here's what that means. In a covenant, when you've made a promise, sex becomes like a sacrament. In Christian marriage, sex is to be a sacred experience of covenantal renewal. A sacrament is an external expression of an internal reality. That's why it's so meaningful. And that's why the Bible teaches that we must wait until that covenant is sealed and settled before we open up and give our bodies away in sexual experience. It is an external experience of an internal reality. And until that reality is settled in sacred covenantal bond, and then it is consummated, that covenantal bond is consummated. It is a sacrament consummating the will of two people to submit themselves to a covenantal bond in front of God and the church. And they privately consummate in order to make that meaningful. God created married sex to be the ultimate sacrament, external experience of biblical covenantal love, internal reality. Sex is the highest physical expression of human communion. Biblical sex is about serving the needs of the other rather than expecting sex to serve your needs. Now, I know that this is completely, utterly counterculturally. It goes against every grain 
that you have ever been trained in, in your sexual education and awareness, acculturation. That's because neural pathways of consumer sex have been plowed into your head by ubiquitous pornography, by ubiquitous sensuality all around us. And we have learned that sex is a consumer good and it has corrupted Christian marriages all over the globe. We have got to redeem it. Got to redeem it. But wait, there's more. Jesus says he also wants to talk about what goes on in your mind. Getting back to Matthew chapter 5. Not just with your genitals, but with your mind. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, don't commit adultery and watch out for lust. This is what many folks point to who are anti-Christian, anti-biblical. And they say, see, Christianity is against sex. Because Did you hear what Jesus said? They're just, they're just a bunch of stove up old puritanical people who don't like to have a good time. That's what folks said about Christians generally regarding sex. And nothing could be further from the truth. When you think about it, there are many parts of the Bible that if read in the original language would make even young adults in the room blush. If you just look at Genesis chapter 2, where Adam burst into song at the sight of Eve. Now, mind you, they're both naked. The Bible begins with a naked man bursting into rapturous love songs over a naked woman in the presence of God, and that is just the opening scene. There's a passage in Proverbs 5 that says, a husband needs to be ravished with his wife's breast. Now, I'm obviously not going to get into that. I don't even know what to say about that one. Uh, I'm not even interested in studying that passage, so I'll just leave it alone. I, I haven't even addressed the Song of Solomon, which is even far more uh, sensual. Goodness, the Bible in the original language, if you were to read it in the Greek and the Hebrew, would be considered pornographic. It would be given a T, uh, what is it, a TVMA, TV mature rating. What I'm trying to say is that the Bible, in bold-faced fashion, rejoices over exuberant, glorious, covenantal sex and love. Humans were created by God to be sexual before they were sinful. Humans were created to be sexual before they were sinful. You see, there is no way that anyone, anyone can say with legitimacy that Jesus or Christianity is opposed to erotic, joyous, sexual love. It's just, it's when they do, it just simply means they are ignorant of the Christian faith and what the Bible teaches on it. That's why it's so important that you know what the Bible teaches about sex. What Jesus does in this passage is set some boundaries. In Matthew 5, he sets some boundaries because we've broken our sex which are supposed to be perfect, with sin, and we broke it. Jesus sets the boundary with an unusual word here. He says, lust. Now, it's not the normal word for sex in the Greek. It's a word that means greed. Greed. And this is the challenge of lust. Jesus is linking consumer sex with greed. Now, is there anything wrong with making lots of money? Because we often apply greed to money and we say, well, Jesus must be saying that if you make a lot of money, uh, you have a lot of sex, you know, then you can't. That's not right. That's actually not what Jesus is saying. There were lots of biblical heroes who had lots of money and there were lots of biblical heroes that had lots of sex. Is there anything wrong with having lots of sex? No, absolutely not. Within the context of covenantal marriage relationships, then what does Jesus mean by lust being greed if it's not about having lots of money or lots of sex? Well, here it is. Greed is selfishness. Wanting whatever for selfish reasons. Greedy people are not only selfish, but often addicted to what they lust for. They'll do anything to get it, even manipulate their spouse by withholding 
sex or using it as a power play to get what they want. And Jesus says that it's very possible to have the same type of greedy attitude toward not only money, but sex. Consumer sex is greedy, selfish sex, Jesus says. Many Christian marriages experience greedy sex, sex that is self-oriented, where sex is about me getting mine because I just need you to satisfy me. This is cause for repentance. Last point. What's the future of love? Jesus hints at it when he talks about hell. You might think that that's a little bit over the top, linking hell to sex. But he uses a curious word here for hell in this passage. He uses the word Gehenna, Gehenna, which is one of the biblical images, actually, of hell. So that's why we link what he's talking about, sexuality, a certain kind of sexuality, to hell. And there really was an actual place called Gehenna. It was outside of Jerusalem. You've probably heard preachers talk about it before. It was where a where garbage was burned. It was a, a landfill, basically. An incinerator, valley, or gully, or crevice, or whatever you want to call it. And garbage was thrown in and constantly fueled as burning. So the fire never, ever, ever went out. People lived and died in Jerusalem and never knew of a day when Gehenna wasn't burning. That garbage dump outside the city literally burned 24 hours a day. And to, to the people that lived there and people that knew of the, the myth of it were actually used that to say it's unquenchable. It's absolutely unquenchable. So Gehenna gets at the idea that hell is a place of unquenchable thirst and unfulfilled longing, hence greed. You see, you and I, we were built to know God. And therefore, if we lose touch with God, the potential to have our deepest needs satisfied is lost as well. Hell in the Bible represents a status of unfulfilled longing, a perpetual state of smoldering without ever having the potential of being quenched or satisfied. So, Jesus is saying that lust-oriented sex, look at this on your screen, Jesus is saying that lust-oriented sex points toward a living hell that will keep consuming itself and consuming itself in unquenchable longing. Selfish sex outside or inside of a marriage never fulfills and it and keeps us longing for more sex, hoping to quench our longing. It never does. And that is a very real type of biblical hell. Jesus says by reason of opposites that if, cons if consumer sex points towards hell, then covenantal sex points towards what? If consumer sex points towards hell, covenantal sex points towards heaven. Absolutely. The biblical symbol of total and complete satisfaction. In 1 Corinthians 7 and in Ephesians 5, the Bible says that the most rapturous sexual love between a covenantal husband and wife is just a dim foretaste of what it's going to be like to fall into the arms of our true spouse, who is God, at the end of time. Last point, the future of love. When Jesus was talking to the woman at the well in John chapter 4, he says, I've got water that if you drink it, you will never thirst again. In other words, it's me who can fulfill your deepest needs. And she says, sir, give me this water. Remember what he says then? 
bring me your husband. Kind of a weird response. She says, but I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, no, you've got five husbands. And the man you're with now is not your husband. Why does he focus on her messed up romance and sex life? Why would Jesus just expose her out there? Although they were alone at that time. Why would he just have to say it out loud? Why would he call that out? Because he tells her that only he can satisfy her. Her deepest needs will never, ever be satisfied through any man or any experience other than loving and living with Jesus. That is the beginning of all our needs being satisfied. There is no other way to get our satisfaction in life until we start with Jesus. Loving and living with Jesus. But she has been searching for satisfaction in men, and she is just as unsatisfied now as she was in the beginning of her romantic sexual journey. She was pursuing lust, thinking it was love, which led her to perpetual hell. You too? How can she be delivered? By seeking foundational life satisfaction in the only place it can be found, and that is Christ. For years, I've been telling my kids that the only person I love more than their mother is Jesus. And I beg them to find, to date, and then mate someone who loves Jesus more than them. Because until their deepest longing is quenched, in the living water of Jesus, no other person will ever satisfy them. If Ladon's relationship, my wife, if my wife's relationship with Christ is not her highest love, then she will look to me for whole life satisfaction. And I'm going to look to her. And if we look to one another for fulfillment, then we'll never find it. And we'll be miserable together, blaming each other for our lack. We'll be demanding something from each other that neither of us can give. This is a consumer relationship and it will crush each other with unrealistic expectations. We will just fall into a consumer relationship, hell, where I'm demanding she adjusts to me, and she demands I adjust to her. And on and on it goes as we consume each other. In other words, if Jesus isn't Ladon's main spouse, if Jesus isn't my main spouse, if the spousal covenantal love of Jesus is not the foundational element of my personhood, then I'll always be trying to make Ladon into something that only Christ can be for me and she'll do the same to me so your relationships of marriage friendship or singleness will never be healthy if jesus christ is not the spouse of your soul and his love the most important thing in your life the question for you to ask is do you need to make jesus the centerpiece of your life. So I don't know the answer to that question for you, but I want to take a moment and lead you in a prayer. And if this is a prayer that you just want to be real in your life, just take the words that I pray, own it, feel it, sense it, and live it. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, thank you for this opportunity to be able to talk about this subject. But more than that, thank you for bringing us to this moment of repentance. There are plenty of areas in my life where I need to repent of consumerism. Where I have demanded of Ladan something that only you can give me. I repent, Lord. I repent of that. 
Search me and know me and find every way in me where there is greed, where there is lust, where there is consumerism, where there is mistaken, mistaking my spouse for you and demanding from her only what you can give me. Lord, my prayer is that you would convert me, transform me into the kind of person that, that lives a life like you would live if you were me. My prayer is that I would be a husband like you would be if you were me. That's my prayer. That I would be a father, a friend, a person like you would be if you were me. I pray, Lord, transform me into your image. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So let's talk about questions. Uh, what kind of questions do we have? What kind of curiosities do we have? Uh, something that you may make a note of and say, hey, I, need, I would like you to clarify a little bit more about this. Anybody in here? Anybody online? I'm trying to still deal with this. It's, Angelo's asking. It's a lot better to cut that body part off or whatever. Yeah. Than to do that. What are you concerned about? You're wondering, is he talking literally? Is he talking figuratively? Or, you know, what is he saying there? Well, you know, what, what's your struggle? Yeah, is it not dramatic enough for you? <laughs> or is it too dramatic? You can't understand it. Yeah, it's too dramatic, huh? That's what that's what is called hyperbole. Hyperbole hyperbole is making extreme statements, irrational extreme statements to prove a point, to drive a point home. I'm as hungry as a horse. I'm so hungry I could eat a horse. Now that's stupid, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Who's going to do that? How do you know how hungry a horse is? Mm -hmm. But yet we use these hy hyperbolic type statements in order to be able to communicate something real. I'm starving. Really? Has anybody ever been starving in America? You know, I'm starving. I gotta eat. You know, all that. I'm thirsting to death. You know, or something along those lines. We make these grandiose statements, and that's what Jesus is doing here. He's employing that genre of language in order to be able to drive home the point. Anything would be better than giving in to lust and greed. Hell. The only place lust and greed goes is hell. It's the only result that it brings. And so consequently... Anything that you it better better you be blind <laughs> than lust because hell is worse than being blind. So Damaris, hey, she's in Puerto Rico, I think, all the way from Puerto Rico. Welcome, Damaris. Question: Is having expectations the same as having demands? Uh, they can be. They can be. So we can feel in ourselves this sense of expectation and then be perpetually disappointed. And all the while, we can be communicating our demands because we're pouting because we, we didn't have our expectations met. And so we're actually acting on demands. We're demanding you do something and my expectation is that you meet my demand. And when my expectations are not met, my demands are not met. And therefore, I'm disappointed. So, yes, demands can lay behind expectations. Demands are back here motivating expectations. The question is what you do with your demands behind all those expectations. And that's something that's got to be worked out between you and the Lord. Uh, you know, your, your expectations may be legitimate. Like you just simply expect that you and your spouse will have a loving uh, sexual relationship. You, you just expect that. 
but then your spouse is in a very different place than you are, uh, maybe a consumer, maybe apathetic, and all of a sudden you're not getting your expectations met. And so that actually could, your pouting, your punishment of them could betray a demand, and then there's something deeper. You know, so why, why do, do your expectations not match up to their expectations? What's going on there? That could need a connection to a counselor, to simply both people, if they're covenanters, both people go to Christian counseling and just start working through that in order to get below those expectations, to figure out where the demands are coming from, to ask where those demands are rooted in, greed or pure covenantal love, or you know, how, how does that work? And then how do we exercise or request those things to be done? Maybe not demand, maybe request. And so how do we do that? That's a negotiative process that needs to be worked through with two covenantal people. Problem is that in lots of the cases, you know, covenanters will have Christian covenantal expectations, but their consumer spouse doesn't meet them. And it's a very sad, sad conflict of regret, really, uh, for these expectations not to be met. So, yeah, I, I can get that. So I hope I've done a good job explaining that. If, if I haven't, don't hesitate to hit me up on email or text and say, hey, you completely blew that. Uh, you didn't answer the question at all. Uh, let's go back to it. So <laughs> feel free. Anything else? All right. Nothing else. So thank you for joining us in Midweek Oasis. Grateful for you being here. Don't forget the Compassion app is up and available. It still is, not just last weekend. There's videos. There's opportunity to research uh, children to, to, to sponsor if you'd like. It's uh, the sermon from last week, the testimonies. They're all up on YouTube. They're all up on Facebook. All you've got to do is review. You know, you can go straight to the testimony, straight to the, uh, you know, the preaching and listen to what was said. And I know you're going to be inspired and you're going to be blessed. And then you may actually want to respond. And so please consider that uh, compassion experience and engage it and wonder about whether or not you might be able to find $38 in your budget. You don't take from Peter to pay Paul. You don't take from the church in order to pay compassion. This is over and above regular giving. And so your regular giving to the church. And do you have an additional $38 out there to sponsor a child? If you do, and you want to trust that in faith, then go ahead and do it. Like Mike said last week, they sponsored one child, then two children, then three children, and never ever noticed the expense. That's what the Lord does when we take care of the poor. I love you, soul family. God bless you. Have a beautiful week. And in advance, happy Thanksgiving. God bless you.